Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Guido, for this presentation and the OSHA uh, group and uh, association uh, for inviting me. Well, uh, I'll try to, to go right to the point. Uh, I could like to explore one particular aspect that I, I'd like to present now. Uh, one particular aspect. Uh, I, could you please? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Who's passing the slides? Is there anyone or, or do you have uh, a do it from here? Okay. Could you go to the next one? <laughs> okay. I would like to, to talk. This is kind of the work uh, we've been doing in the office I direct in the last years. Uh, uh, it's very important for me to make clear that uh, in a way, everything that I'm going to, to explain here is the result of a number of researches and experiments that have been carried out by a big team of people, and some of the people are here, uh, like Camilla, Alessandro, Guido, and uh, uh, also uh, other people uh, in other years, and uh, in which theory, slogans, publications, books, magazines, models, experiments, events, uh, parties, dinners, uh, buildings, uh, or techno cases like this character we designed here, uh, are kind of the uh, same materials and they're connected in some common experiments and interests. Uh, could you pass, please? Uh, so today I would like to talk of a very particular thing that we're developing now in the last years and that in a way is kind of our most important interest now and it's only one of the things but uh, of course I, I promise not to go too long so I'm only talking about one thing. Okay, could you go to the next one please? So today I'd like to talk about domestic life as an urbanism as a, and domesticity as a political arena. If you put, with the, please, the next one. Uh, are you familiar with this show? Uh, yeah, everyone's familiar with the little house on the prairie? <laughs> the prairie. Uh, well, this is the Ingalls. This is a famous media family. Uh, and it's a TV show that started to be broadcasted in 1974 and that ran once and again, and I'm sure if we go now to the TV, we would find it somewhere. And the Ingalls again, Laura Ingalls, young, Laura Ingalls, teenager, during Laura Ingalls, already married, you know. You have them all the time uh, on TV. Uh, but I'm very interested in this image, because we see the Ingalls family, and these like pilgrims, Americans, and uh, originals of the construction of a whole society, as they are explaining the in the TV show, but what is interesting for me is to see what's behind uh, it's a house. And actually we could say even a home, because it's probably one of these, those images that we have like an insight produced by the media, and we recognize this as the proper environment in which, in which the family happens. And actually the home, uh, we don't know what's, what comes first, like the egg of, of, of the chicken, uh, but here the, uh, we don't know whether the family comes before the home, whether the family is producing a home or the home is actually manufacturing a family. But there are two constructions, social constructions, one more technical or uh, material, the other more relational, that in a way, in our minds, get or somehow are related. Okay, I would like now to go to the next one. Here we see Caroline. Do you remember Caroline? Uh, okay, uh, she's inside the home with her daughter, 
and she's playing with the doll. And what is interesting for me is to see that we get a very clear idea of what happens. What is that that people do in homes, we could ask. And we see that if there's a chain and a scaling. We architects are very much familiar with this idea of scaling. And we have the tiny people here, the tiny person, the slightly bigger person, and the big person here. And there's like a progression from, uh, let's say, a fixed uh, uh, sad face to the smiling one. <laughs> well, well, what is interesting for me is that they are all wearing the same dress. Uh, it's a particular Victorian dress that if you go to the internet, you will see that even though you might not believe it, there's a whole debate on this uh, Victorian dress. Uh, it's, been the attention, it's been in the attention of thousands of people, <laughs> you will see. Uh, this is an image taken from the pilot episode that was produced to convince investors and uh, channels to do their series. And the importance of this dress apparently was vital for them, for them to, to support the, the show. Uh, okay, what is interesting for me is that the, the mother, Caroline, is wearing this Victorian dress and her daughter is wearing a very similar dress and the daughter's doll is wearing another Victorian dress alike to that of the fictional mother and that of the real mother. Uh, there's, something coming on, coming, uh, there's something going on here that has to do with homes and dresses. Okay, could you go to the next one? <laughs> Uh, this is from the first uh, session or uh, tempora uh, temporada uh, yeah, season. Season, season of the show. Uh, you see again Caroline with the same Victorian dress again, and her daughters wearing the same kind of dress alike. But it's very interesting what they're doing now. They're setting the table. Actually, Caroline is setting the table, but she's doing it in front of her daughters, uh, which are very smiling, and they're surprised by the uh, arrival of the father, who is not setting the table. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. And this is another image with, uh, of season uh, number six. So it's long time after, you see that Laura Ingalls is all, already a uh, little uh, girl, a uh, woman. <laughs> uh, the important thing here is that meanwhile the father is reading the paper or the book. Uh, uh, Caroline is teaching her daughter how to sew a uh, Victorian dress, how to produce herself, how, how to become herself a person who is able and capable of producing the Victorian dress uh, as the one that they are wearing. Actually, by the expertise that I found on the internet discussions, the particular thing is that this is the very dress that she was uh, Caroline was wearing in the pilot. So expertise found that, that by the examination, detail, scrutin scrutiny of the dress that is particularly the same dress that she was wearing, the one that apparently the daughter is producing six seasons later. <laughs> so, well. uh, no, 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 let's, let's go in the stage. So, setting tables, uh, dressing, and producing dresses is something that happens in homes as is, they are depicted uh, in this uh, show. Uh, meanwhile, men are reading books or are writing home. Well, that's another thing. But uh, I would like to uh, uh, stop here a little bit. So in a way, there are a number of concepts that are produced by these shows and that in a way we get, uh, we get from these shows and somehow they become kind of, ins of insights that we use to orientate uh, our ordinary behavior. That's my theory, but of course can be discussed later. And what is this notion of the home? In a way, I would say that, and this is a risky uh, assumption by myself, but the, no, the home and the notion of familiarity, uh, there's a notion of familiarity that is related to home. Uh, home is probably the place where families are both happening and produced. Uh, homes are single devices that in a way are the environment in which the familiarity is produced. Familiarity meant like families related by blood, 
but also at, at, as those places where we get to know uh, how things are going to be. Home could be seen then like the place where we uh, get or we know where our sleepers are and that we have a dog that comes and recognizes us. So uh, it's the place where things happen in a familiar way to us. These two notions of familiarity, the one of the construction of a tiny group of people connected by familiar or by blood connections and the environment in which somehow we find things uh, that happen in a way that is predictable to us and is sem somehow known by us uh, is a concept or are, con are two concepts that are somehow related, produced, happening in a very particular architectural device that we could call the home. Okay, now we can go to the next one. Uh, sorry for this uh, explanation. Uh, this is a... Uh, uh, from the spice of an anonymous English book. Uh, and I think part of these ideas that are connected to the, the Ingalls uh, have been produced uh, in the 19th century with the development of the industrial um, uh, context and of course the, do the development of modernity, of modernity and domesticity as the, uh, one of the uh, sceneries of social construction. <laughs> But I would like to see what's happening in this the, the, the depiction of the domestic environment that we can see in this uh, English book from 1866. Um, you, we see that there's a number of uh, scenes in which a young uh, daughter is somehow exposed to a number of situations in which domestic uh, life is produced. Situations like washing, like cooking, like uh, being at the table with uh, her husband, uh, things like uh, uh, getting uh, ready or made up, or uh, okay, all these things that somehow are supposed to be the activities with which women uh, get to contribute to the production of that environment and that atmosphere of the home. And the second thing that is important for me is the central uh, scene in which the mother is somehow uh, teaching the daughter how to behave and how to be the actor that produces all those little fragments of domesticity. Because she says, consult me on household management. I will tell you how to wash, get up linen, polish furniture, to keep the house clean and sweet, to beautify the person. Uh, in a way, what is interesting for me is that uh, the mother is telling the daughter, if you don't know how to do things, ask me, because I know and I can tell you how to do those things in the same way that Caroline was teaching her daughters how to sew, how to produce, and how to reproduce uh, the kind of living and the kind of material support that produce that that we could call the home, the environment of familiarity. Uh, it's interesting for me to see that the daughter is not asked or called to experiment herself. She could have been said, if you don't know how to cook, just try. If you don't know how to wash, experiment it yourself or get a life or go and travel and find yourself because you will see many different ways of doing it or go to the university and get exposed to an environment in which you will see how people uh, in the history of life have been washing and you will get critically equipped to do it. No, sis just said, ask me and I will tell you how to do it. Okay, can you go to the next one? Uh, this is uh, another very interesting thing in which the, dot, the mother is, is again, well, this is a, an illustration from the book Carlos, Just an Ordinary Boy uh, by Mary Louisa Molesworth. Uh, and what is interesting for me is that uh, this is also, again, a domestic scene that is supposed to be kind of exam an example, a good example for others to follow because we have to remember that those books were used to teach people again how homes should be constructed and we see that the mother is reading to her children and saying uh, now be quiet uh, now be quiet all of you I'm going to begin 
Now be quiet. Again, in a way, there's this idea that holes are places where the knowledge is kind of fixed. It's either something that mothers know and they directly, with, without innovation, without challenging, without discussion, just teach the daughters how to reproduce, know how to challenge, uh, how to discuss. And again, that the proper way of learning is, in a way, to be quiet. So the, uh, let's say, the transmission, reproduction, reproduction uh, of knowledge is in a way a direct act in which the knowledge is fixed. Okay, well, I'm going very rapidly, of course, uh, if someone wants to discuss any of these things later on, uh, we'll have more time. Okay, can you go? Ah, okay, oh, sorry. You know this one? Uh, this other song? Also from 1974, you have to remember that the little house in the prairie was from uh, started in 1974. Well, of course, this is Heidi Girl of the Alps. Uh, this is the anime version uh, by Fritjo Enterprises. Uh, and of course, it's based on this Swiss uh, novel, Heidi's Journey of, of Wandering and Learning by Johanna Spirit. Spirit, do I say properly? Well, probably you know much better than me. Okay, again, we see. Uh, let's say a familiarity group, in this case a little bit more stranger, it's, some, uh, it's not blood uh, related, but uh, blood related, or something like that. Uh, well, we don't know, never about blood. <laughs> but behind this, again, this architectural construction that we could call the, the home. And actually the nature again, like, well, uh, we'll see. Okay, I would like now to, to go to the next one. Uh, because we see now the family and they're doing something but, but new that it, it never happened before in this conversation and it's that somehow they are leaving behind the home and they are facing and looking from above uh, something that is Frankfurt, the city uh, where the aunt lives and something like that. So in a way being here is being a part and being able to see down the the city. The home, in this case, is not only the place where the knowledge is fixed and the location for familiarity, but also it is the, the device and environment that's got a very particular relationship with the, let's say, the social, the common space of the uh, city, which somehow is that it's somehow disconnected. And it's a place from where we can see the social, the collective, the political, in a way, from, let's say, above, down there. Okay, can we go to the next one? Well, this is, uh, I really like this one. <laughs> we see Heidi, and in a way we get to see how domestic environment uh, is different from the city. We could never, the, the, the nature here of the mountains, since they are kind of apart from the city, they are kind of domesticized. And that's why I think uh, Heidi could be in her underwear uh, running with dogs around. <laughs> uh, we couldn't imagine Heidi in Frankfurt uh, wearing like that, she could get arrested, uh, especially if she was <laughs> to see shows this kind of relationship with the dog that apparently is also very <laughs> Uh, well, that, let's not go much farther <laughs> on this relationship. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? Okay. And now I'd like to come into not media, but a uh, picture taken from uh, space, which is quite actual and very natural for all of us. <laughs> IKEA. This is the Tokyo IKEA. Uh, actually, the Tokyo IKEA was also open in 1974. So 1974 is a very important year for domesticity and homemaking, uh, both in media and in real life. Uh, okay, it's important to me for me to see that some of these ideas that we can see in the media that have been, let's say, ma the, the manufacturing of the domesticity and the family and the home uh, in the media uh, are connected to daily life. And uh, somehow are knowledges that are behind some of the most important architectural projects that are happening, happening right now, like IKEA, which in my opinion is probably, is probably one of the most important in terms of dimension architectural actor uh, running nowadays. Uh, okay, can you go to the next one? 
Uh, some of these ideas are remaining in many of the catalogs, advertisement, even design of the IKEA environment. For instance, this idea that at home you can forget some of the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, obligations of social relationships, uh, like uh, Heidi, which was in her underwears at home, uh, is uh, explored in this kind of uh, media rhetoric. Oh. The idea that uh, 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 home is kind of the opposite of the city, and in a way, it's a place from which you can see things outside, and you can on you only see. Uh, you only find familiarity and fixed knowledge and not debate and not dispute uh, is again repeated in this idea of the home as a political space the home as your own republic uh, can you go to the next one this for instance catalog uh, portuguese catalog from 19 uh, from, from 2009 says your house is your kingdom and it's kind of confusing because at the same time it's your kingdom and it's your republic, so it, it makes a, both a king and a person. Exactly. Okay, and again, if you go to the next one, uh, this on the catalog, this one from Spain, again it says your house is your kingdom, your republic, whatever. And if you go to the next one, again, my house is my kingdom and it's the republic of my house. Okay, that's been the central of this work that we developed last year and that is becoming now like a <laughs> particular thing because MoMA has decided to vote it and it's going to be the, the first um, performance ever bought by the um, Department of Architecture, so this is the first time they actually buy a situation. But look, I will tell you uh, what I'm interested on. It's a project called IKEA Disobedience. This is a model of what we did, and uh, I would like to, uh, if you go to the next one, to say, to read something. Okay, let's keep this lady here, who's called Candela. Again, she's got a dog, and she's got a uh, grandson. Okay. I will read this, it's a little bit exaggerated, but it's, it, it, it will somehow shape the, the rest of the conversation. IKEA delivers societies. IKEA is a purveyor of social structuration. 98% 98, 98 of the people depicted in the IKEA catalog are young. 92% of them are blonde. Mine in Spain, there are not so many blonde people. So. <laughs> They all have some sort of family life. They are either children or busy having children. Everything IKEA manufactures is aimed at turning the sphere of domesticity into a sunny, happy, apolitical space inhabited by contented, healthy, young people. The sense of a home or a household's life, however, may also be constructed from day to day in a quite different fashion. Not all of us are healthy, not all of us are young, not all of us are into having children, at least uh, not consciously. Uh, okay. Imagine, for instance, this uh, lady here, Candela. Candela lives with her three daughters, her grandchildren and six dogs in an old apartment in the Lava Pies district in Madrid. A number of, what is interesting about Candela, you see her house, it looks very good in this picture, but it's actually quite messy, it's kind of, it's kind of like a uh, house. Well, but what is interesting about Candela is that a number of elderly male neighbors living on their own regularly have dinner at Candela's place. Social networks based on solidarity flourish as, at such gatherings. Candela cooks for them, and since Candela is, is got a uh, problem with money because she uh, is one of these persons that when she's got money goes to the machines to play it, to gamble it, she found a very interesting way of constructing a domestic uh, economy. She cooks for them, for those men that are widows, widows, you say that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, are not able to cook. And they bring food to Candela and they buy things for her. So in a way it's uh, 
let's say, a community uh, that is not a republic of Candelas. It's not the place where Candela get disconnected, but the very place from which she connects to others in a common project of solidarity, but also of uh, construction of a, let's say, a public sphere. Let's go to the next one. In this case, maybe it's even easier to understand how the key idea is challenged. Uh, this is Berta. Berta lives in a squad with a community of lesbian women. Occupying the property, you can see that this is an occupied house, occupying the property afforded them an opportunity to develop a project based on principles of communal economy and self-management. Uh, taking care of material need is not, only, is not the only issue they see as a common concern to be managed collectively. Contributing to the emotional and professional empowerment of each, or each member of the community is also seen as everyone's responsibility. So what is very important is that this home is again not an independent republic in which everyone gets there to get disconnected from society. Or it's actually the center of a political project in which women that don't know each other, that are not familiar to each other, get together to get empowered as an opportunity to challenge daily life and to construct and intervene into the public concerns and the public debates. So in this case, it's again not an independent republic, it's not their kingdom, but it's their device to intervene in the common sphere of the uh, society. Okay, next one. Manolo is another one. <laughs> It's very interesting. They are all the IKEA disobedience because, of course, as you see, they don't, uh, they couldn't be in, a, in a, an IKEA catalog. Uh, you couldn't see an IKEA catalog with a community of lesbians squatting a house. <laughs> for a toilet, of course. Yeah. Manolo. Manolo lives with her wife in an apartment in Vallecas, which is a, a let's say, working class neighborhood. Uh, he works as the editor of an independent magazine whose publishing costs are defrayed by an association devoted to supporting different forms of activism. <coughs> From his studio, uh, uh, which is like a working space, you see here, in the home, Manolo edits the publication's political contents. His uh, home is again not an independent republic, but the site granting him access to public debate and participation. We could go on with many. We have a whole catalog of IKEA disobedience. Uh, we can go with this one. Tony, for instance, she's got no family, but she's got a community of people that get together to sing. And when, she's, uh, when it's her, her birthday, she celebrates with the, this community. So again, her domesticity is kind of spread out and is spread up within society. And, okay, or if we go to Nayan or Aurora, for instance, is never living in a, in, in a family like living. And again, she finds opportunities for affection in the city and in other places. And if we go with uh, Danielle, is living in the gym and in the uh, social network, networks where he finds opportunities for friendship and, re and sexual relationships. And if you go to the, uh, okay, and this is the installation we did, which is again, a, I mean, and let's say, uh, an disciplinary use of the IKEA furniture. We used them not following, of course, the, the requirements uh, for design that they depict in the catalog. But in a way, we did it to produce a counter image in which we can actually think and see, so the domestic life as something different, as something that is not an independent republic again, but a little bit more complex. But the politized ordinary life is encouraged where, uh, wherever the domestic and the public are segregated. <laughs> the home has often, often been imagined as the space of disconnection from public strife and disputation, as the location where one can forget the rest of the world, as the site where we encounter only what is familiar to us, the independent republic of our home. However, a different way of constructing ordinary life may be conceived, namely one where the home is a site for confrontations and encounters with all that is different, and familiar or under dispute. Decided, for instance, 
uh, whether or not we are on the bill, how domestic courts are to be assigned, or to what extent we want to take responsibility for garbage separation, uh, through all these processes we emerge as politically activated citizens from the privacy of our homes. This Nokia's injection to contain social interactions within sunny, apolitical home enclaves is what we propose as an urban counter notion of the domestic. Not a neutral space, but one installing controversy and disagreement precisely at the site where affections may also emerge. Okay, this is the end of the reading. <laughs> I will pick it up later to produce the papers. But now it will start the, let's say, the design more properly. Seen. Okay, and I will develop that through three sets of projects and three very basic concepts that I would like to explain a little bit in depth. Could you go to the next one, please? The first one. Uh, please, you know. Okay. Uh, the first thing I would like to challenge is this idea that the home is something. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, it's something that happens in a single architectural device. You remember the Ingalls? Oh, sorry. Uh, the Ingalls were having this house, this home, recognized as a single architectural device. We've been doing in the last year. Uh, big ethnography of the domestic. These are all the interiors that we've been uh, researching, more than 96 now. Uh, we've been talking to everyone living in those places, we've been studying in detail how they use the house, how they transform it, why they live in that particular location. And we found something very interesting to challenge this idea that the home is something that happens in a single and unique architectural device, the house. Can you go to the next one? Well, no, no, first, the, sorry, this one. This is the case that we study. It's the place where this girl, that this woman that is over there, lives with his daughter, with his son, uh, alone. She's, got, she's a single mother uh, with a son on his uh, responsibility. This is the living room. And go to the next one, please. Which is, she was sitting right there. And this is the whole house as we go it and as we explain it. So you can see that it's a very normal apartment, like many others, uh, in the outskirts of Madrid. This lady is a teacher at the university. Uh, she's got a quite stable timetable, uh, labor timetable. Uh, she comes here at night and she shares the house with his uh, son. Uh, she uses this bathroom, he uses that one, and they have a kitchen, a kitchen here and a, ba a bathroom here. The entrance is here. So you see that this is the living room, that's the son's uh, bedroom, this is the terrace that is also used as a place to storage uh, toys, and that's the place where the, the son works. Can you go to the next one? Okay. But when we see in detail how domesticity happens uh, in this familiar life, it's a little bit more complex. Because in order for the mother to actually be able to work, uh, she's got a babysitter, which is another architectural device, a human one, uh, that produces an association between the mother, the son, and the babysitter, and the house. Uh, but that's not enough. Because in many occasions, as many of you know, uh, university teachers have to stay longer at the university. And at, that, at, that, at, those, at those moments, she needs some help. That's the reason why she's living in the outskirts of Madrid, whereas she would prefer to live in the city center. Because that way, in that way, by living in the outskirts, in a neighborhood where her father, uh, her father and mother are living, she could somehow occasionally ask them to take care of her son when they are uh, when she's staying longer at the work. Uh, also, that makes it possible for her to occasionally travel and go to conferences that are required for her to be to uh, remain as com competitive in her job. And for that, also she's got a relationship with a colleague that is living in London and occasionally she goes to visit him and stay here. So she can take part in the 
London University Live and take part in the conventions they're carrying out there. We could go on to different things, like for instance, uh, many times, many nights, Friday nights or Saturday nights, while her son is sleeping, she feels like going out, but she couldn't. Uh, of course, like, because she's very responsible, she doesn't want to leave her son alone. So, uh, what she does is just to help her, herself a gin and tonic, and she stays here while her son is sleeping there, and she gets connected to a number of websites and social networks that she finds in the internet, and online she gets connected to other people and gets relationships that she feels that are like those that she had uh, when she was going out, when she was younger and she had no sons. Uh, occasionally, sometimes, those relationships end up in encounters. Encounters, offline encounters that she carries out in a tiny apartment her family owns in the city center and that they rent occasionally also uh, to tourists. But when it's not occupied, she could go there with her uh, partners uh, and have sex there. <laughs> uh, we could go on with many other things, but we see that this tiny family is actually producing and spreading up uh, her domestic life, not in a single space like the Ingalls, but in a whole association uh, spread up within cities, within nations, within the territory, uh, within online spaces like those ones connected to the offline. So home here is not a single device, but it's actually the association of a number of different devices, many of them online, others offline, many at big scale, others tiny scales. And okay, let's go to the next one, please. Uh, this is another house we've been studying. And it's a very interesting architecture, in my opinion. It's an apartment, a tiny apartment that is no, with no more than 40 square meters. And it's used by a community of five, not, never less than five uh, males uh, living in the neighborhood of Lava Pies in Madrid, sharing it. And they are young males that are working uh, by selling things uh, in, on the street. And they all come from Senegal, from the city of Tauba, and they all are members of the religious community of the Modis, uh, that, as many of you will know, is a variation of the Sufi uh, religion. Okay, this is kind of uh, an ugly, maybe, architecture, but it's very interesting in the way it's working. I don't say that it's desirable, but it's interesting. Uh, could you go to the next one? This is the living room. Uh, uh, in this living room, there are two people sleeping many times, and during the day, there are other people that come to rest and to eat and many other things. Uh, could you go to the next one? This is a place above the, the bathroom that is, it used to be a place to storage. Of course, this house was not designed to, for this particular use, it was designed just for a couple or something like that. Uh, and this place was a place to leave the suitcases when you were not using them, but now it's another bathroom. Let's go to the next one. This is an image from the toilet. Uh, let's go to the next one. This is the bathroom, the proper bathroom in which other people are sleeping. Uh, okay, let's go to the next one. So we do all this, uh, this uh, reconstruction of the home so we could see it in once. And you could recognize the living room here. Uh, that's the door from where you enter, the bedroom, this place above the, the bathroom, you can see the lamp in the bathroom, and uh, the kitchen. Uh, okay, uh, it's very important to see, for instance, the role this decora decoration is playing, which is very important, because those are photographs of the religious leaders, and uh, one of the uh, motors to make all this society uh, working is that there's a strict, a very strict control and uh, domain on the individuals by the whole group uh, through religious uh, practices in some cases. Could you go to the next one? By the way, that's the interesting thing for this first point. Uh, when we see the house, it's not the only architectural device that is somehow uh, locating or uh, making it possible this domesticity. Because when we see uh, what happened with this family, we see that elder people, children and women are remaining in Tauba, in this house. 
Whereas males that are in the best moment, in their best moment to make an economical profit of their movement into Europe, uh, are living in this apartment, and when they feel that there's any conflict or there's a lack of work of selling uh, in a city like Madrid, they could even move those guys to another apartment similar in Paris, like that one that we trace. Uh, it's very important to see that this could only uh, work with a series of devices. For instance, it's very important that the people who go there, when they arrive to Madrid, imagine this guy when he gets older, if he wants to go to Madrid to work, what does he do whilst he's in Madrid? Uh, he goes to a Senegal resta Senegali restaurant uh, in Lava Pies. In that place, he would ask to the people working there if they could uh, call their cousins, for instance. The cousin would have been informed already because the grandmother has got a mobile phone and she would call those guys over there. Those guys would never take the phone from Senegal because then she would be charged. What they would do is to go to the locutorio. Uh, you know, locutorio is a phone center uh, where also you can get some business uh, support like photocopies or printing and things like that or internet access. But it's also working like the place where the Senegal community goes and have the opportunity to get connected by a very low rate, low rate to the people that are in Senegal. Uh, this could never work without the watch, the domain, the control that is run in places like the mosque, which is again a tiny flat, a tiny apartment in Lava Pies neighborhood that is only decorated with some rugs and some things on the walls. But it's a key uh, architectural device in the organization of the whole community. And we could go on and on and on, for instance, seeing the role that the Gold TV channel plays in the holding of this community, let's say, peaceful. Okay. But again, what is important is this first idea. Homes are kind of urbanism in the way that are composed by a, a, a number of fragmented and separated but connected uh, architectural and technological device that only can only be seen as part of a whole uh, unified construction in the performance, in the daily performance of the relationships that keep those architectural fragments together. So, could you go to the next one? <laughs> next one? Including a larger population than London, Paris, Berlin, Milano, Brussels, and Barcelona all together. So in my opinion, we could even talk of the real capital of the European Union, this idea of Europe the, uh, united in, in diversity. Uh, okay, let's go to the next one. But it's very important for me images like this one. <laughs> because all of you that are sharing flats probably would recognize this as an important place where there are many things happening. And we could talk about political uh, struggle, alliance, uh, strategy, <laughs> about the worship issues that are very important. What is interesting for me is that in many occasions, uh, from the architectural point of view, we tend to recount or to design these places in terms that are totally different to those that are somehow live in the served apartments. Could you go to the next one? Because equalitarian distribution of tasks is much more than efficiency, much more important than efficiency in these places. And in a way it brings opportunities to see that some parameters and some ideas that have been developed in another scale for urbanism and for explaining the city as a place where efficiency maybe is not the most important, but political action, uh, relationship between difference, many things, or equalitarian access to resources, uh, as, one, as was one of the first ideas behind a plan, a planning, is somehow applied to that scale also of design. Could you go to the next one? For instance, I would like you to compare this kitchen with a bull town wonderful kitchen. And we see that this is slightly different. Uh, could you go to the next one, please? Because multiple origins, uh, origins is much better in these occasions than clear identity. We made many uh, different, uh, we, we kept conversations with more than 50, uh, uh, with the people living in more than 50 cases of served house for this research. And they all 
uh, or not all, but many of them, declare that one of the reasons why they like to be in places like those is that they could confront otherness, that they could find people that are very different to them. And one of the big examples they said is uh, to, to, to make an evidence that that was somehow written is that in one year they had tasted so many different styles of food. And that actually if you go to the kitchens, you would find um, uh, ingredients, uh, tools that they had never seen before. So what in many cases they like is uh, about those kitchens, it's not that their design was pure, was uh, seen as something very essentially uh, consistent, but precisely that it was kind of a cosmopolitan environment in which difference, uh, in which uh, different origins, in which diversity could be found uh, and produced. Uh, please, go to the next one. Uh, another idea that we found, um, in many occasions the house of course is being depicted as a machine in which uh, equipment, uh, uh, resources are somehow efficiently uh, located in the design. So there's a washing machine, there's a kitchen, there's, there's no the need in a good design to repeat things. But it's not like that in those architectures, because we saw that it was very important to have your own uh, thing to handle clothes uh, in your room, because otherwise you would be very, you would take a, a big risk of not getting dry uh, clothes at any moment. Okay, I, I'm just kidding, but a little bit. But let's go to the next one. So in a way, we found this idea repeatedly that redundancy was more intensively desired than optimization. Okay, next one. So in a way, and the last idea, we could see many things going on here, that in a way, differentials was a source of sweet con comfort. Uh, remember Caroline with the daughter producing a daughter that was similar to her and producing a doll that was similar to her as an opportunity for the daughter to be trained again as a mother that in, a, in the future will produce. Okay, all this in the eagles. In a way this would be difficult to find so literally here. Okay, let's go to the next one. So that was the topic of this, re uh, of this experiment we did that was the uh, okay, let's design as a way of accounting these realities a prototype of a third house that we call the rolling house and we could produce in association with Escofet that they produce this technical floor that we always see that uh, and all of this are there and also some devices like we broke and other, other things. But let's go to the next one. So the, the third house we designed looked like this and we tried to learn from our own students. Go to the next one. What is interesting for me of this job is this, that by designing this we had to find out uh, how could we actually make this role in society moving from one place to another, having this kind of uh, connections to different cultures activated and making them or taking them to domestic spaces to be confronted. And we could see that the architectural devices were not the only ones as spatial and material devices uh, making a key role here that in order to construct the connections between these fragmented uh, uh, homes as the ones that we saw from the Senegal community or as the ones that we saw in the mother uh, with the grandfathers and the babysitter and the, uh, there were other tools, other materials that somehow were associated to the architecture and were somehow shaping also the architectural possibilities and devices. Materials like these ones. Could you go to the next one? For instance, it was only possible to construct this society and these continuities from one fragment to others uh, by things like those channels of a spatial continuity that in a way were playing a, or providing a contemporary notion of some of the continuities that have been provided by in the tradition of modern architecture uh, and had to do with the possibility of having access 
uh, to low-cost uh, airlines uh, being able uh, to uh, get communicated with uh, devices like we know and we use all the time or currencies that could be moved from one location to another, uh, collective projects of sharing things like all those that we can find in the internet to share uh, leads or, or vans or cars, whatever, be located access to money, being able to send money from one place to another with things like Western Union. So in a way, the materials that were also constructed in this architecture were not only uh, those that traditionally have been recognized by the architecture, but also others that somehow we thought that we could try to move or to associate to our practice. Could you go to the next one? Also, we saw that from very, uh, let's say, old ones like letters uh, or cards, there were other addings providing uh, the possibility of being in a simultaneously uh, but diverse a spatial presence. Uh, of course, there's no need to say more about this, you know. Next. Uh, but also things that are not so easy to, to identify, like shared fictions and narratives that were somehow constructing possibilities for the association. So the fact that many people have shared uh, the experience of seeing friends made it possible for them to look uh, it as appealing to start a home, or the possibility of sharing images of uh, the life of celebrities or things like that, was something that was providing a common experience and knowledge, and in a way we could find those conversations that were important to construct that common home that we call the Rolling House and the Rolling Society. Go to the next one. And the last one that is very important is that many of these ways of living can only be uh, understood if we see that behind them there were projects for the future. Projects like uh, saving money by working in a place uh, to bring some kind of access to some ideas of comfort that presumably uh, will be available in the future. Or what? Well, many of them. Like many people that go to one place, like the Senegal people that come to uh, work to Europe, uh, so in the future they will have some money uh, or someone to take care of them when they are get uh, older. Go to the next one, please. Okay. This has been the to to be able to rethink architecture by using those materials have been the I won't go into this, but those who want have been the part of our intention uh, and goals in the last years. For instance, in this project, we try to see how through a spatial design, we could make a good relationship with bank management. This was the project that we called New City that we sent as a proposal with for a European and we, we won a second prize. And we developed it together with the private bank, uh, Banif. And we developed a whole system of managing, managing property in which there could be a direct translation of property into spatial, combina spatial combinations. Okay, it's in our web. Those who want to go deeper into that one, they, they can go in our web. But what is basic is that the, uh, the investment, uh, let's say, suit, could be uh, translated into a spatial arrangement. And there could be an evolution of, uh, synchronized evolution of both of them. So depending on the personal conditions at each moment of the life of a person, they could transform at the same time the spatial uh, development of the house and the uh, financial suit. Uh, it was related to the management of that property. Go to the next one, please. Yeah. Oh, this is something that we're developing now in this uh, project that we're doing now in Tokyo, in Japan which is the EJ Lab, it's called now, they change the name every week. But this kind of place should make it possible to optimize the connection <laughs> between the uh, online uh, spaces for interaction and the offline ones. So it's a place where uh, uh, relationship between audiences that are online, uh, offline, like we are here, could be maximized with others that are dispersed in the, in the land or in other locations, but could interact all together in the, off, in the offline world, connected in the online world. Okay, next one, please. 
or we have developed even funny things like this uh, telenovelas, I don't know what it's saying, like soap operas in South America in collaboration with the Bogota uh, Javeriana University, the, the, project, the, the international uh, uh, program there. And we developed uh, architectures that could be played not only to buildings but to the insertion of some of the ideologies that are in and the cultures and sensitivities that belong to the world of architecture to very basic uh, narrative uh, products that could be then give opportunities for other people not so much aware of the tradition of architecture uh, and to have access to them. Well, this is a funny one you can see in the internet also. Uh, it's in our website and I don't think it's so good, but it's just an example of the way it works. <laughs> Let's go to the next one because it's kind of funny. Okay, so this was the first idea. Uh, there's an opportunity to think and to work with architecture uh, in the possibility of not thinking home as a single architectural device, but a number of things that get connected by materials that are a little bit uh, more difficult for us to use. Let's go to the next one, the second. <laughs> Uh, and this is from fixed knowledge, you remember this old uh, discourse on fixed knowledge and homes, to sweet lab homes. Could you go to the next one? Uh, are you familiar with Tupperware? <laughs> yes? Have you ever been Tupperware host? <laughs> no? Yeah? Okay, well, many people have suffered with Tupperware homes. Tupperware homes. <laughs> okay, this is an image, uh, very particular. Uh, it's a commercial. Uh, from Tupperware. And we, of course, I apologize for uh, this image of the woman as a soldier of the home at the service of uh, her husband and children, which, of course, from a gender perspective, uh, many things could be said against this image, of course, and the program that it uh, carries. But what is interesting for me of Tupperware is the next one. Could you go to the next one, please? Okay, this is another app, app work, in which they were calling for women to become Tupperware hosts and be the actors of the most creative marketing. Uh, for me, this image is a little, in a way, similar to this other. Could you go to the next one, please? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what? Because, uh, well, of course, the, the composition is similar, many things are similar, but also, in a way, uh, Tupperware were taking or were reconstructing homes as laboratories. Could you go to the next one? Okay. Uh, this one. This is uh, Bonnie Wise. Uh, it's one of the most famous Tupperware hosts. She became kind of a celebrity in the States in the 50s and 60s, and as you see here, uh, Bonnie is throwing a uh, bowl full of water with this famous, as they say, the famous and amazing Tupperware seal. Uh, it's preventing the content of that bowl, which is water, to be spread out on all this community of scientists uh, that are watching the experiment. Uh, you can some I imagine her sister-in-law <laughs> that is uh, frightened at the same time then amused by the experiment. Okay. Uh, yeah, like <laughs> she wants the water to be spread out around the sister-in-law. Let's go to Of course this is kind of to the right? Of course this is kind of a basic laboratory, but we could see that in this case, uh, knowledge it's not fixed. It's actually the home, the architectural device or the environment in which knowledge, in a way, is challenged and is experimented. Uh, of course, we could see that this is kind of a basic experiment because they try to sell these things. Uh, but in a way, the knowledge that was produced in these places get also to have influence on the design of the products. There are many testimonies on how things that happened here ended up being told to the designers that would change the actual design of the products in the catalog uh, to what happened here. That was possible because once a year, we go to the next one, those sellers and Tupperware hosts that were best sellers uh, were called to uh, this big convention in Orlando 
And even though they seem especially bored, mind these ones, is so bored in the talk, uh, they could explain to the designers, of course, in a very asymmetrical way, it's a basic thing, uh, what had happened and the information that was important for them to do better products. Uh, and of course, the intention was to sell more of them. Uh, okay. This, of course, belonged to the moment in which internet was not working and many other things were not uh, running. But we see, as the sociologist Norge Marvers, this spot that, go next, please. Uh, there are a number of debates in which architecture and the experimenting of architecture has become a public debate. Please go to the next one. If we see all the discussion that is carried out about technical issues related to the architecture of the homes in blogs like this one, uh, the Sustainable Home Blog, we see that making the knowledge on architecture uh, evolve is something in which many people get together uh, in, by the mediation or by means of blogs like this one. So we see that people discuss whether uh, uh, a heating system would make their homes more uh, uh, energetically efficient or whether it's better uh, to have a Victorian style or whether it's uh, more uh, appropriate for a teenage room, teenager's room to have lock or not to have it in the home. All these things that in a way we could identify as those related to our field of action are publicly debated in blogs like this one. And it's not only that they are challenged and experiment by a community of people, it's that precisely because they experiment together and they discuss that together, it's because they get connected and they get somehow relating one to each other. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, we see that in the very interior of homes, there are big debates that on the one hand make everyone uh, uh, able and needed to discuss technical issues like whether uh, the tetra brick should be placed with the biodegradable things or with the non ones, uh, or whether we should put the paper which is uh, uh, it's got oil in it uh, with the uh, food or with the paper. Uh, we are discussing very technical issues that in many cases have to do with chemistry, in other cases have to do with engineering, in other cases, and that's why important, that have to do with architecture. Uh, this possibility of using the architectural discussion to produce a community that precisely because they discuss and evolve their knowledge on architecture, get together, uh, was the uh, idea behind the project that, please give it, to the, to the next one, we call the Tupper Home. And now I'm obliged by the to show this. Have you read it? Uh, we have license for the Tupper Home. Tupper Home, Tupper Home, Tupper Home, Tupper Home, Tupper Home, Tupper Home. We were so confused with this name, and now we have to put this because we got the license. Tupper Home is happy now that, uh, without using it. Okay, let's go to the next one. What we did is a, a, a catalog of components, very uh, inexpensive components that people could use to transport their homes and that could be locally produced by a number of uh, uh, craftsmen that were living in Madrid. So we were providing the plans, the solution, the technical uh, possibility for them to go uh, we were all also providing the names of the people that could, could produce those things to them so that people could somehow transform their home by calling these numbers and telling Mohammed that they needed a uh, uh, door like that uh, instead of their house. What, what we were trying to do is not only to help people, but to make them, to enroll them in the uh, discussion of architecture. Because somehow we were thinking that, could you please, uh, uh, that a transformation like this one that could be done by composing those elements that we had previously designed uh, could be something very useful for people. And by doing that, they would invite other people to see their homes 
And what happens when we have renovated our home and we call someone is that, of course, they tell, they tell us, oh, well, how did you do this? Was it very expensive? I'd like to, to have a hanging room like this one in my apartment. Oh, give me the telephone of the Mohammed person that did this. <laughs> you know. So if we could equip this uh, and encourage this process, please go to the next one. This is the house we designed, and uh, you will recognize the basic strategy of locating at the periphery of a central space. It was a tiny apartment, this one, for instance. All those components, and go to the next one, and leave that uh, open space in the middle, like empty, so it was useful for many things, and hanging rooms, and this could be uh, done with all those components. And go to the next one. Uh, some of them were kind of funny. <laughs> that were very much involved by users. Uh, go to the next one. And this is the first one that was built. Uh, this is for people. This is cheap. It's not that they have uh, clothes. They are not producing clothes. <laughs> go to the next one. Yeah. You see, they did the first evolution of the the chair that we were so fond with. Go to the next one, please. OK. But the actual uh, interest for me is to see that Actually, this idea of the home as a, post, as a lab it, uh, could also be related to the possibility of, of, co of constructing a whole community. Could you not connect some this? A whole community of people that would be discussing about money, about technical solutions. Go to the next one, please. And would be related to so this lady could explain them that the, this couple that they could use the staircase and buy to whatever, to whatever, and then this one could do this and the other. And at the end, they would remain as a whole community linked by this common experiment of making their homes evolve. What we call a horizontal <coughs> or a, a grassroots urbanism constructed by tiny architectures connected by the ways and the practice of experimenting. Uh, continuously. Go to the next one, please. Oh, no, to the previous Sorry. one. No, to the previous one. Oh. No, no. <laughs> no previous ones. <laughs> 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 secret, that's the last one. No, 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 yeah. Uh, I would tell you. Uh, here. No, here. For this, for instance, this is a, a building that we, we're uh, designing now. Uh, it's a commission to produce a place that is enrolling the whole society of Madrid to have an experience and discuss the possibilities of electrical uh, cars for the city and for their lives and for all these things. Uh, but what? I will tell you this about this next time. Uh, the next time? And we have even done jewelry like this uh, uh, what? To, to produce these kind of critical communities. Thanks. And the last concept. We're almost about to finish. <laughs> uh, go, go to the next time. And this, this idea that architecture could be the compulsory pass point as the promoter of techno disputes. Go to the next one, please. Uh, this is not a project, but it's very interesting for me. I propose you to take a deep or a careful uh, watch to architectural renders like this one. Uh, this is for me very interesting because we see that this wonderful architecture, we have beautiful architecture, <laughs> uh, is announced uh, by a situation like this, in which of course everyone's young, healthy, good looking, sexy. Uh, but also the very situation is quite promising because these uh, beautiful girls are somehow seducing these beautiful guys that in a way are showing themselves like uh, good partners and is, if you look at here, there's a promise that in the future if they behave properly, <laughs> they could end up like those ones there. Uh, with the romance consolidated. Uh, actually, the architecture is a key part of this. We all have the feeling that uh, by going by, uh, to an apartment like this, something like this could happen, maybe. Or well, this is what the, uh, the render is trying to tell us. Go to the next one, please. Okay, this one is not so easy to read, but there's something similar going on here. Of course, the architecture is much better. Uh, 
uh, and the situation is kind of not, kind of not so obvious. But I would like you to see, uh, but, but of course it's sunny, blue sky, flourishing, blossoming, trees, all these things that are, you know, uh, render of rhetoric. But what is interesting is that this guy that is kind of respectable looking with this haircut so, uh, let's say, uh, proper, uh, uh, this clothes, he's talking to something that we could call an alternative uh, charm guy. <laughs> uh, this thing is, uh, yeah. And even though they're very different, they had to communicate. And this guy is uh, kind of making him laugh, and they could be friends, even though they might be very different in ideas and ideologies, in all those in aesthetics, in all those things. Uh, in a way, I find behind these things a little bit the idea that it is possible for society to have happy endings, like this one. Could you go to the next one, please? Like this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a way, I'm telling us, of course, I'm exaggerating. The possibility that uh, respectable people like this one could be joining this uh, not so respectable guy, <laughs> however, and they could live together and see one ask him about uh, his past. Uh, uh, what well, you know? <laughs> Go to the next one, please. please. Uh, okay, this is the last project that I would like to tell you about. Uh, it's a project we did. Uh, it's called the Casa Santa Total Diocesana de Plasencia. And it's the renovation and extension of a 15th century building with a 19th century extension, and we had to add a 21st century one. Uh, but what is interesting for me is to see this image, because those buildings have been used for centuries as a Catholic minor seminary. For those who are not familiar with the Catholic Church, that's a place where young children, 12 years old, uh, go to get the first step of a Catholic training to become priests. Uh, of course, this image maybe is a little bit too much, it's too hardcore, uh, because of course it's in this epoch, in the 50s, where Spain was a dictatorship, fascist is dictatorship, as many other places in the world, but let's go to the next one. Okay, this one for me maybe is more interesting, because what we see is that the daily life in this place was designed, in a way, of course, to promote uh, an homogeneous education that was somehow uh, having the project that everyone going there could have the same ideology and, in a way, even the same bodies. Uh, of course, it's a difficult project, but we know that it's something that somehow is been behind the education Catholic Church is promoted in their educational centers. Could you go to the next one, please? Okay, this process was not an uh, independent one, or it's not independent from architecture. Actually, architecture was a vital actor in the promotion of this unification of the lives and behaviors and bodies of the people living here. This is a floor plan of the 19th century extension that I was telling, as it was in the 50s. And you can see that each of these cubics was a place where one of the seminaries was sleeping. It was the dormitory of each one of them. And uh, they had no door, and there, were, there was an arrangement. So during the night, a priest could go around watching the behavior uh, of all these seminaries and preventing those behaviors that were not uh, adjusting to this uh, uh, model that they wanted uh, to be promoted to be somehow prevented and even punished. Uh, well, we could imagine what sort of things they were trying to prevent. <laughs> each one could imagine where they play cards. <laughs> uh, could, you, could you go to the next one? As Peter Slotter died, is uh, uh, pop up. Uh, this is something that is very much within Catholic Church and has to do with one part of the Catholic Church and has to do also with the architecture, the tradition of Catholic uh, architecture. So, as Catherine Slotter interpreted it, the architecture of St. Peter's Square 
is somehow providing this possibility that what happens to the balcony uh, and the Urbi and Orbi, in its name is already explained, uh, pray, uh, is spread up to the networks of inherited roads from the Roman uh, uh, Empire. And somehow is providing this project for the world, for Europe first and for the world then, that the periphery of Rome could be saved to the image of that that is somehow promoted in the center of Rome. Could you please go to the next slide? Uh, we see that this idea of the foundation of, of Europe, like something that is spread up from a, from a center, uh, is actually quite similar to the floor plan or something like that. Uh, it's in the origin of many of the big institutions that have shaped the idea of a European, a common European Union, like Eurovision, of course, uh, this famous place where Julio uh, Iglesias, uh, ABBA, all those big uh, cultural actors have been uh, spread out. Could you go to the next one? Okay, but when we see in detail Catholic Church, we see that it's not so unified, it's much more interesting. Because we see that there are people that are in favor of legal abortion, uh, there are people who are uh, in favor of uh, gay rights, uh, of contraception methods. There are all sorts of discussions going on in the Catholic Church nowadays. So the Catholic Church, as, as, it, as it is constructed, is a context in which dispute and uh, uh, disagreement is happening as daily life occupation. Could you go to the next one, please? I think this one is repeated. Yeah, go to the next one because I thought it was not working. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, this was a central project uh, for us to transform a place that through architecture, by means of architecture, uh, as I explained, uh, was promoting kind of a unified uh, way of being linked in society to one that could maximize the possibilities of difference to emerge and to be installed in daily life. And this is the project as we designed it. Could you go to the next one? Of course, we had to do many things like adjusting the scale, the shapes, everything, the materials to the periphery. This was uh, to, the, to the neighbor buildings, creating, of course, sensitivity with the genius uh, loki of the place, uh, in some cases, the genius of these places is kind of punky. It's a genius lucky anyway. Could you go to the next one? And we had, of course, to create spaces for a, 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 a proper connection with the, with the neighborings. And well, could you go to the next one? Uh, well, many things that you could recognize and, as the application of traditions in architecture. Could you go to the next one? This is a chapel. Could you please go to the next one? And this is again the chapel. Uh, you, uh, this is the garden at night. Uh, could you go? Yeah, this is the balcony of the terrace on top of this that was kind of designed for a communal life. Uh, could you go to the next one? This is the entrance to the kitchen, in which of course you can see how we were trying to uh, make a big distinction between the historical languages and those that we could bring as new things. Could you please? Even in the geometry, the use of geometries and in some uh, cuts, so the actual layers of the existing remains uh, could be seen and read it. And this is a chapel that we designed as a self-service chapel. It's the first self-service. <laughs> <laughs> This means that many people were in wheelchairs, so we decided to, even though the visa didn't like them, but uh, we explained that they were meant to make everyone to be in a wheelchair, view the mask, but yeah, go to the next one. And uh, yeah, go to the next one, yes. And yeah, go to the next one. Yeah, go to the next one. Yeah, Alvaro Sisa. Could you go to the previous one? Alvaro, Alvaro Sisa said that, it, no, to the, to the first one. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kids version of my architecture. I very, I very much like it. <laughs> yeah. This, for instance, was very dis discussed by the bishop. Uh, 
you didn't find proper to do this because you said that it looked like a whorehouse. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it was find proper to do a grasp with the language of a whorehouse of a technology. But of course, this good thing about Catholic Church is that they have arguments for everything. So you can say, but Bishop, I'm surprised you forget uh, this pray by, uh, by uh, Christ saying, I'm the the light of the world, and that's what we would try to do with the cross, and the cross is the light of the world. Yeah, so he, he agreed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the bishop discusses it. <laughs> I'm not believing it has the same thing, but I'm 20% coming. Can we go to the Okay, but what is important for what I'm explaining you is that this uh, project of providing the opportunity to, for this community to be politically activated and being discussing all day long and not unified like doing these things, uh, push up, so, uh, was played by an architecture of toys. We equipped the building with a set of toys. We put located toys all around the building. Uh, toys that were meant to, for the design to be unfinished and to encourage uh, those users to make a risky and personal statement in order to be able to make uh, use of those devices. Let's go to the next one. Uh, it's, as what I was saying before that about remote control. This idea that when we are in the living room, uh, we have, I remember when I was in the living room with my sister and we were watching TV and then someone took the remote control the discussion started because I wanted to see the gossip uh, debate, and my sister wanted to be the cha Champions League. I think it's called Champions League. Yeah. It's called Champions League. <laughs> so I had to explain that, in my opinion, it was much more respectable to see the gossip debate that they were discussing whether Alberto de Monaco was gay or not. <laughs> it was a very interesting topic for me that it was vital to understand the contemporary uh, life. My sister was very disappointed to hear that because she thought that gossip uh, programs were kind of trash and uh, awful things to be eliminated from the life of uh, contemporary societies. But even the but, uh, soccer matches were much better and Champions League was something that was meant to be seen. Uh, so we had this discussion and what is important is at that moment we both emerged as citizens uh, having a relationship uh, based on the opinions we got to discuss among us. Not like people that were unified, not like in the military that uh, you get to become part of that society by being uh, the same as the other ones. Uh, but here we were actually related to each other through a discussion in which we were constructing ourselves like independent political actors. Uh, but of course, I'm exaggerating to make it very clear. But Hey, go to the next one, please. So I will only tell you one device. It's the garden. We designed the garden, uh, well, by not designing it actually, but putting these things, uh, these numbers, uh, that were related, each one to uh, a different apartment. And in those apartments, of course, there was a person living, an elder person living. So what we did is to uh, provide to each of the persons living here a piece of land so they could do whatever they wanted in that piece of land. But there's something funny here is that we never define the limits between the plots uh, or even the paths to get there. So it was actually a way to promote a kind of a discussion. <laughs> you know, the next one? This is a photograph of uh, uh, Stefano Guerri. Uh, wanted to publish this project, but he wanted to have uh, where he was doing talks. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but he wanted to publish it with the people living there. Uh, we had these photographs taken with uh, other people already living there. That, as you see, they're very different from the render of the young people about to have sex <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> uh, go to the next one, please. And this photograph is very interesting for me, and with this one I will finish, because what you see is that the, the garden is totally transformed. It has nothing to do with the previous image I presented to you. And actually you see that there are crops coming here, 
And that guy over there is not posing, but he's actually watching us because he's the guy taking care of this area. <laughs> so, uh, the photographer tree, he's so much. So, uh, yeah. so he's watching actually. Could you go to the next one, please? Okay. okay. But we have to see this as a battleground because there was this is the result of a big controversy that we could study by keeping big, long conversations with all the actors affected by this piece of land. At a very particular moment, uh, very, very close to the moment in which the first occupants of the building arrived here, this guy that was uh, having his piece of land here decided to start growing vegetables uh, in his piece of land. Uh, there's nothing bad, apparently, on that. And he was using his plot to grow uh, lettuce and tomatoes and asparagus, which I don't know what they is. Next time, could you please? But there was a problem. There were some hands, some hands living here. Those two ones here, one here, one here. And they considered totally ordinary and unappropriate, very loud, very not very good taste, to have grocery grow, uh, vegetables growing. Uh, at the entrance of a very respectful place like the Casa Santa Dota. So they found <coughs> that it was important for them to uh, occupy that place with roses and flowers or some other uh, vegeta vegetation that they found much more respectable than, than the lettuce or, or tomatoes. Okay, next one. They couldn't convince this guy but what they could do is to convince two other people, uh, one of the nuns and another of the priests, and they together constructed arguments. The arguments were, uh, uh, in the tradition of gardens, vegetables have never been used to welcome visitors. <laughs> this was a very built-up argument. That they argument with all sorts of examples. In Versailles, you couldn't see the cauliflowers. <laughs> when you arrive in the potato, you get to see roses, and the cauliflowers are back there. You know. Okay, that was the first movement, but it was not enough uh, to convince this, this guy. So next one. That could you please talk to him? Yeah, this guy was very clever, and what he did is talk to many other people. Actually, four more people, and he convinced them that he would uh, take care of their plots. So, actually, he was making his point bigger and occupying more space because he started to grow much more vegetables, uh, annoying, of course, the bigger community. Could you please go to the next slide? Um, he, was, he could do that uh, to a very basic path. Uh, they would allow him to use their plots, and he would, uh, in reverse, share his plot of his, his crop with the, them all. So as he was growing more vegetables, but he would share them with the owners of the land. Could you go to the next one? Those are the owners of the land. <laughs> and they even have their own arguments. The argument is, the, the argument is, was, we don't want a garden for the visitors, but for ourselves. So you see that they were very politically attached. Because we want to get something out of our land, not just to look good to visitors. Okay, of course it didn't convince the, the ladies. <laughs> the ladies were very, very smart. What they did is the, uh, the, the ultimate uh, movement. They hired, they enrolled an expertise they found a lady that had been growing gardens all around the city for years, for decades. And they convinced her to help her, to help them designing their flowers garden. And they could always say, well, yes, but you don't know what you're doing because you're not experts. But we have an expert with us. And this lady is agreeing that it's totally improper to have lettuce and tomatoes and potatoes and onions uh, to receive visitors. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, so there was, uh, I don't know, previously to that, there was another movement very good by these ladies. They were seeing that they couldn't win the discussion 
So they did what many people have done before. They directly occupied the space. <laughs> and they started to grow flowers. <laughs> so the, no matter what this guy was doing, they removed the onions and they started to put rose gardens. So it made it very difficult. And since they were living here, they could know when someone was coming to, uh, to frighten the flowers and the roses and everything. So all it ended up with a, let's say, a provisional agreement in which this guy agreed to move here to leave the entrance to those ladies and the, the expertise and to go on growing vegetables in this area that was not so visible. Okay, if we go now, there are many other things going on and uh, this landscape is totally transformed again. But with this, I want to say that architecture could be also a device not only to fix knowledge, but to activate daily controversy as an opportunity to provide a, a role of citizen a politically activated to those who are using architecture. Of course, when I talk to politics, I'm not talking of politics of right or left or something like that, but the politics of tiny things, of daily life, like whether roses are more beautiful than tomatoes and things like this. But you will see that in your daily life, there are a number of disputes like this one that are shaping your daily experience and the way you relate to others, like football or gossip things, or, or we could even go to political issues, of course. Uh, could you go to the next one? So I would like to finish with this image, which is a domestic space, very different from that from the Ingalls, or very different from that of the uh, Heidi people, in which, in a way, it's also a rendering of architecture, but no one's smiling here. <laughs> but still, it's kind of a place where affection is possible, and in which, for instance, this blind guy is holding uh, his hand, or, uh, or is, uh, is leaning on this other, the bishop, uh, this other are helping, and the nuns, even though they are fighting with these people uh, for the rose garden, have prepared this, uh, this uh, uh, wine and these things. So, in a way, we can see that in the case of Tupper Homes and all this uh, fraternity, affection could be something promoted also with discussion and by means of an architecture that promotes this political affection. Thank you very much.